Good morning. And we're going to turn to the first item of business, which is general questions. I should just point out, by the way, for information, um, we're now zeroing this clock. I think there's some inquiries about it yesterday. Before questions, um, this clock, which usually is just timing the length of the whole question period, is now going to be zeroed at the beginning of every question. That's just to encourage members to keep their questions succinct and the ministers to keep their answers equally succinct. So we'll have a question. On that note, question number one, Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I take the hint to <laughs> ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the response to the three consultations informing its education governance review. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. That I fear that your uh, warnings about the clock were ill-timed in relation to who's answering the first question. <laughs> Um, the responses to these consultations show broad support for the principles of local empowerment and improved collaboration in education. Those principles at the heart of our reforms, which are based on strong international evidence of how a high-performing education system works. Ross Greer. Thank you. Despite the Deputy First Minister's answer, the consultation response has shown overwhelming opposition from parents, from teachers, councils, expert bodies and young people. Does the Scottish Government seriously consider bringing forward a bill based on these proposals or will it go back to the drawing board and give schools the resources and staffing that they actually need? But it's the, the Government is providing schools with uh, resources, uh, very welcome resources indeed. I've just been in a school this morning at Bowness Academy where I was hearing further about the way in which pupil equity funding has been used to strengthen educational opportunities for young people and to close the poverty related attainment gap. The government is looking carefully at the consultation responses. Uh, there is very clear support for the principles in the education reform agenda about local empowerment and improved collaboration. What the government has to do is to um, assess and consider the many detailed points that have been made in respect of this agenda. And that is exactly the work that I'm undertaking at the present time. Thank you. Question two has not been lodged. Question number three, Graham Day to ask the Scottish Government how the introduction of average speed cameras on the A90 has improved safety between Dundee and Aberdeen. Minister Hamza Youssef. There, there has been a significant improvement in driver behaviour and speed limit compliance since the average speed camera system became operational on the A90 in October 2017. Speed surveys carried out between Dundee and Stonehaven have shown that 99 out of 100 vehicles are now complying with the speed limit. This is a significant improvement when considered against the fact that previously three out of five uh, vehicles were speeding, uh, as I say, prior to the installation of this technology. These improved levels of uh, speed limit compliance are leading to fewer camera detections, fewer fines for drivers, but most importantly, of course, safer roads for communities and all users of the A90. Graham Day. And that is indeed very welcome. However, the Minister will be aware that Bayer Scotland has been conducting a road safety study into the stretch of the route which runs through my constituency around Inveraldi, Teewing and Petter Den, looking specifically at the interaction between the A90 and a series of junctions and the need for some of my constituents to cross this busy route to access public transport. Can you advise me when we can expect to see the final report and its recommendations? Minister. Uh, the member raises a very good point. Of course, average speed cameras are, are not uh, a silver bullet. They have to be taken in conjunction with a number of other, other road safety improvement measures. Uh, so he's very aware of the study that's taking place. Uh, discussions on this topic were held between Transport Scotland, Bear Scotland and the local communities in April 2018. Uh, the final report is expected in summer 2018. Mike Rumbles. Reducing speed with drivers is very welcome, but of course the most important point is about accidents and reducing accidents on the A90 between Aberdeen and Dundee. When will we be in a position to know how effective the speed cameras have been in reducing accidents? Minister. I'm hopeful and very confident of that. I suppose the reason for that is if you look at the other average speed cameras across the trunk road network. So in the A77, Symington to Girvan stretch, there's been a 68% reduction in fatalities and serious casualties. In the A9 Dunblane to Inverness, there's been a 31% reduction in fatal and serious accidents. So, of course, we have to let time for the A90 average speed cameras to embed. Uh, we'll gather the data and I'll ensure that members are kept up to date on those important uh, casualty and fatality reduction numbers. Question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the concerns of people in the agricultural community regarding livestock worrying. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. I recently attended a meeting of the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime, 
Livestock worrying is a very serious matter, causing serious injury and death to livestock, as well as financial loss and emotional distress to many farmers. I therefore welcome the concerted efforts by Police Scotland and other partners to tackle this issue. It is a criminal offence for a dog owner to allow their animal to worry livestock and local authorities have the power to issue dog control notices. Uh, we have written to all 32 local authorities seeking further information about how they use their legislative powers. Working with partners, we will consider all practical measures which effectively can tackle further livestock worrying by out-of-control dogs. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As you may be aware, last week I announced my intention to bring forward a consultation on a Member's Bill to tackle the issue of livestock worrying. So I would be grateful to know whether the Cabinet Secretary agrees that more work is required to be done to tackle this problem and provide clarity over the responsibility of dog owners while accessing the countryside. Cabinet Secretary. I very much welcome the proposed consultation uh, by Emma Harper. Uh, Emma Harper, presiding officer, has taken an enormous interest in this and has gone out of her way to involve and discuss with farmers and stakeholders this matter, which is a very serious concern. So I very much welcome the consultation uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, how that develops and, and also what further action we can as a parliament consider taking a, in order to tackle what is a very serious problem indeed for the Scottish farming community. Finlay Carson. Said officer, given how serious this issue is, can the cabinet secretary explain why a change in the legislation requires a private member's bill and the lengthy process that that entails. Can the Scottish Government not bring forward a change in legislation as a matter of urgency to alleviate concerns in the rural area? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would have thought that the member would welcome uh, Emma Harper raising this. Uh, any, any member is entitled to pursue a, a member's bill. I think it would be quite wrong, as he does apparently, to ask the government to criticise members of this parliament for seeking to exercise their powers. I've never in 18 years as a member of this place heard the sentiment uttered that members of this parliament should not be able to do their job in this way. And I for one think Emma Harper is doing an excellent job. Yeah. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome Emma Harper's consultation, but also the comments from the Cabinet Secretary about dog control notices, because I think the farming community, many were unaware of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act, and I welcome his continuing efforts to publicise this. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I follow with close interest the actions taken by my colleague, the Minister for uh, Community Safety. Uh, and uh, recently, I was very pleased that following a, a, a debate on the 8th of May, uh, Annabel Ewing has written to all local authorities in Scotland seeking further information about how they use their powers under the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. Uh, but I think it's fair to point out uh, that local authorities, some of them in particular, have been active on this, as is illustrated by the fact that dog control notices, presiding officer, have risen from 92 uh, in 2011 to 290. So it's plain that local authorities around the country are looking at this more seriously but as I said earlier, there's much more to do, and I very much welcome Emma Harper's taking the lead on this in this chamber on these matters. Question number five, Jackson Carlo. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what arrangements are in place for patients at the Beats and West of Scotland Cancer Centre who require treatment at weekends or after 6 p.m. on weekdays. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. There are structured pathways in place for every West of Scotland NHS board for patients being seen locally both in hours and out of hours. These have been developed by the Beats and West of Scotland Cancer Centre in partnership with the local boards. This support is available 24 hours a day via the Beats and Cancer Treatment Helpline between 8am and 8pm and the National Cancer Treatment Helpline between 8pm and 8am. The Beats and Helpline is staffed by cancer trained nurses who carry out a structured telephone assessment on each call. The telephone assessment is supported by a validated process to identify the frequency and severity of symptoms. Axon Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and share with the experience of my constituent Alison Gardner after her sixth course of chemo at the Beatson. Feeling horribly unwell, she has instructed phone the Beatson Helpline to find out it was closed on Fridays and weekends. 
She was directed to A&E at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, where on arrival she was told that as a Beetson patient, she should not be there, before after four and a half hours been given antibiotics in an open area, subject to the risk of infection from other patients. Meanwhile, the Beetson told her husband to complain and get her out of there, as this was dangerous to her health. She was told it didn't matter what the Beetson said, no bed would be made available, especially as the doctor said the Beetson was empty. A doctor the following day was derogatory regarding the advice from the Beetson and spoke negatively about the oncologist, saying she would be in her bed last night as they don't have to do night shifts like A&E doctors. He then discharged her, saying this is what he would do with, quote, a normal patient. Cabinet Secretary, whatever the pressures, is this any way for my constituent to be treated? And more importantly to her, is this a satisfactory way for any other cancer sufferers experiencing complications while undergoing chemotherapy to be treated now or in the future? Uh, well, Secretary. can I say to Jackson Carla, I'd very much like to look into the details of the case. If he can furnish me with the details of Alison Gardner's case, I, I would absolutely want to look into those. Just on a general point, um, what I can say is that all patients uh, on or within six weeks of treatment at the Beatson receive an alert card prior to their first treatment with information about who to call with concerns about treatment, side effects or symptoms 24 hours a day. There are two numbers on the alert card which can be used either before or after 8 p.m. in my initial answer I described which of those services uh, provides uh, which um, uh, at what times of day uh, to patients. Now uh, if something went wrong with that in the case of Alison Gardner then I would want to explore that uh, so if Jackson Carlow can furnish me with the, the information I'll certainly look into that matter. Question number six Jeremy Balfour. To ask the Scottish Government what action is taken to improve the accessibility and increase the availability of properties of all tenure types that are suitable for disabled people. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I believe everyone should have the right to live independently. Uh, local authorities are responsible for assessing housing requirements within their local communities. Uh, we are currently refreshing the local housing strategy guidance to make sure realistic targets are set out at local level for the supply of wheelchair housing, and we'll ask local authorities to report annually in progress. Uh, we're investing over £3 billion in affordable housing to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this parliament, a 76% increase in our previous five-year investment. 91% of homes built by housing associations and councils in 2016-17 met the Housing for Varying Needs standards. Jeremy Balfour. A recent report published by EHRC highlighted the need for urgent action to address the lack of suitable housing for disabled people. Will the Minister inform Parliament how many new built homes he will require all local authorities to ensure are built to a wheelchair accessible standard? And if he will not, why not? Minister. Uh, President officer, I'm meeting with EHRC Scotland uh, next week on the 30th of May uh, to discuss the report that they published uh, on the 11th of May. Um, President officer, I have uh, made it very clear uh, to local authorities that I expect them uh, to ensure that their local housing strategies and their strategic housing investment plans uh, take account of uh, what is required in terms of wheelchair accessible housing. I've gone further than that even, presiding officer, asking them to interrogate their housing lists uh, to see exactly uh, what wheelchair accessible housing is required for people uh, in their area. I reiterated that again this morning. I've also said to local authorities that in terms of subsidy, um, we will look at increasing subsidy where they are building wheelchair accessible housing and they can talk to my officials on the ground about that. I have a determination uh, to increase the amount of wheelchair accessible housing that there is in Scotland. As for Mr Balfour's question about all tenures, it would be very helpful uh, in terms of get, getting folk into uh, owner occupation, for example, if the Tories did not keep cutting the incomes of disabled people here in Scotland and across the UK. Question number seven, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the trend in spending per primary school pupil since 2010. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President officer, the latest local government finance statistics show that expenditure on primary education increased by 3.3% between 2014-15 and 2016-17 in real terms or 6.3% in cash terms. This is despite continued UK government real terms cuts to Scotland's resource budget 
and shows clear evidence that the Scottish Government has treated local government very fairly, providing a real terms increase in funding this year compared with 2017-18. Ian Gray. Unfortunately, uh, when swallow does not a summer make. In fact, the real terms expenditure per primary pupil is now £513 less than it was in 2010. The figure for secondary school pupils is £205 less. If education really is a priority for this government, why won't they give our schools the resources they need? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that is precisely why there has been an increase in the resources allocated to primary education over the periods that I set out. It's precisely why, it's precisely why there has been an increase in funding to local government in 2017-18. It's why local government is spending more on education in the last two years. It is also why we're putting in place the Scottish Attainment Challenge, pupil equity funding, and it's about high time the Labour Party got behind the measures to strengthen Scottish education by investing in education, which is what this government is doing. Thank you. Question number eight, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what mental health support it has in place for apprenticeships and work placements. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our 10-year mental health strategy aims to improve uptake of and access to a range of services aimed at improving mental health in the workplace. Employers have a duty of care towards their employees, apprenticeships and apprentices and people on work placements and should take appropriate steps to ensure that mental health and well-being is protected and promoted. We fund the Healthy Working Lives programme in NHS Health Scotland, 1.6 million in 2017-18, to provide advice and support to employers on the measures they can take. This support includes a free and confidential advice line and free training courses to help equip employers with the skills and knowledge they require. We provide one million per year to see me to deliver Scotland's national programme to end mental health stigma and discrimination in the workplace. David Torrance. Scotland, what support is expected to be offered to work placement employers to ensure that mental health service users are integral to the programme and that employers sustain their commitment to mental health to ensure positive outcomes for the individuals in the long term? Minister. Well, Fair Start Scotland will provide tailored, flexible and person-centred support for people at risk of long-term unemployment and to people with a disability, including individuals with mental health problems, to support them towards employment. Participants will work with an advisor who will support the individual to develop a programme of personalised support. Fair Start Scotland provides 12 to 18 months pre-work support with a further period of in-work support, tailored to suit individual needs. Individual placement and support will be available for those with severe and enduring mental health problems. Question number nine, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the long-term financial position of NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. For 2017-18, brokerage of £23 million has been approved. Provision of brokerage is always uh, predicated on a realistic plan to return to financial stability, and NHS Ayrshire and Arran is developing a three-year plan to return to financial balance. 2018-19, the board has been supported with additional investment of £11.6 million and a share of £175 million to support investment in reform. John Scott. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and note her response. However, while I understand that efficiencies are necessary as well, I am concerned that these efficiency measures appear to mean that 90 beds will go at Cross House with more beds rumoured to be lost at air at a time when 33,699 bed days were lost to NHS Air Shannon last year due to delayed discharges at a cost of £7.9 million. Pounds. Cabinet Secretary, we need more beds in NHS Air Shannon and closing hospital wards is not what patients or staff want and will only further reduce the functionality of the Ayrshire hospitals. So, can efficiencies be found elsewhere? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, first of all, it's important to say that we would expect uh, NHS uh, Ayrshire and Ireland to uh, deliver the improvement plan and bring the board back into financial balance. An improvement director has been appointed for a period of six months uh, to help them uh, do that. He will, John Scott will be aware in terms of the issue of beds, that uh, these beds were always uh, additional beds, they were never uh, core beds, but we have made it very, very clear that there can only be a reduction of in bed numbers if there is also the appropriate uh, diversion of people and therefore a less of a requirement for those beds. So they have work to do to make sure that that is a, a programme that is uh, putting patient safety at its heart and we will be working very close with them to make sure that that happens. I'm very happy to write to John Scott with further information about that. Thank you very much and that concludes General